Hello to the now 100 sites that have joined us. How is that even possible? <laughs> um, I'll try to be more demure, which is not actually possible for me. So those were the big ideas, if you will. And if you had a chance to read chapter one from It's All About Thinking, we highlight those and we go into some depth. And so now we're going to move into a couple of those ideas just in depth. Um, it, uh, not surprisingly, I'm going to spend a little time now talking about young adolescent development. I'm going to dig in further about what's happening in their brain. It's really exciting um, because brain research keeps changing. And so we know a, a lot more than we knew when I started teaching. I won't say exactly how many years ago, but there was a nine at the end and an eight before that. And so middle years on philosophy and pedagogy really came to bear in the 80s. But what we knew then and what we knew 10 years ago, what we knew seven years ago, but even what's wild now is what we know just two or three years ago has moved us forward. So I'm just going to maybe highlight or tweak what you know and get you focused in a little bit more tightly on, oh, that's why that happened today. <laughs> or that's maybe what I could expect tomorrow now that I know what to look for. Here we go. So we're in the um, understanding young adolescents and then being prepared to respond to what that looks like. I have a few little, couple of teaching examples right at the end, um, illustrative examples, but I'll make little comments as we go. Um, so first um, is that um, the brain's actually reorganizing in adolescence and you may, and young adolescents in particular, and you may have actually seen that if you teach kids, if you have the same kids, you loop with them, you have them in six and seven or seven and eight, sometimes you see they actually seem to move backwards from where they were at a previous time. Part of that's because they're rewiring and making new pathways. It doesn't mean that it won't come back, it just means we need to give them that opportunity, but they're shaping their brains as you can go. And as you can imagine, their lives include more than school. Has anyone noticed that a child that you work with? And so what's being shaped isn't necessarily happening in the classroom. It's happening all over the place. But we have a role that we can play in terms of creating healthy pathways and um, supporting that development to happen. Um, so brain plasticity, which is gross and disgusting and exciting at the same time, is like never before, which is also why it's not great when your um, young adolescents who love to take risks fall and whack their heads, because there's all kinds of stuff moving around. But it's okay, just keep working it. Um, there's something to be said for, um, how can I say this? We do, anybody who has their own little one remembers how um, the kids um, started to talk and to walk, and anybody who happened to teach grade one at any point, Children learn to read often at that time. Like they start out, it looks like that. And by the end, they're like writing words that make sense. <laughs> Similarly, but at our own developmental level, you can see new things happen in the middle years in very short periods of time. You can give kids a manipulative or go on a journey or start a st story and finish it the next week and their jump can be really significant if we scaffold experiences. So can I use the word explicit teaching and it won't sound like a bad word in this room, <laughs> right? Or gradual release of responsibility. If you pick a strategy and you work on it with kids all week, they will get better at that strategy. And if you use it again the next week and let them be more in control of it, they can use it more independently. And probably by week three, they could teach another class how to use that strategy. And by that I say it would be amazing if they could teach another group of kids because that's when you own it, is when you explain it to somebody else. Um, there is something super cool, I won't super dig into all of them, but what are the areas that are being reshaped during adolescence? One is reward systems. Um, friends, colleagues, frolics, we have to be really careful about external rewards in the middle years. Because if we build the habit around giving external rewards, you'll actually come to expect that reward, even though they love it so much and they give you so much feedback. I love candy, you're the best, Mr. Stellar. But that's different than trying to build that own sense of success, ownership, here's what I did well, or getting a compliment from somebody else on what you did. Um, regulatory systems, we're gonna talk about self-regulation next time, but there's a ton going on working with what can I do, what can I manage, what's my strategy, Kids can think about it now, but we need to help them do it. And then the last one is relationship systems, which we're gonna riff on now, which is helping kids learn how to have relationships because they're seeking them 
whether they're aware of it or not. And so that if with our core competencies in, core competencies in British Columbia, you could say it's a lot of personal and social awareness and responsibility, couldn't you, right? It's actually scaffolding those things. And anybody who feels guilty for spending time on them, the payoff is magnificent. You'll have more success with content and curricular competencies if you put the time in with the personal and social um, goal setting, learning relationships, learning how to take turns. With me so far? Great. Um, did I mention that the reorganization is rapid? Um, things happen quickly in the middle years. Uh, and if anybody wanted to say, but what do you mean by middle years? I mean middle. Like there's no like grade four is too young and grade 10 is too old. It's that whole span in there. The research is pretty much focused though on age 12 to age 16 in terms of, and you'll see this right now, what I'm going to share. There's so much happening in that time. Let's just use the P word for a moment, shall we, everybody? Yes. No. Um, I hope you have a classroom with windows. Um, <laughs> there is something happening in terms of the hormones in the body, and that connects directly to your limbic system. So that part of your brain that's happening, the, the hormones and what's developing is really shifting and changing. And I know kind of inside we know it, but let's just make it explicit for a moment again, which is there's a party going on inside and you're not in control of it as a young adolescent, um, which is why the, the toughest kid that you've ever worked with who never expresses emotion suddenly cries in front of you. There's all this stuff happening that you don't have control over. Um, so these structures that are changing are very connected to what's called the emotional center. Um, there's so much more knowledge about um, social emotional learning and the emotional center of the brain just in the last maybe eight years. And so I'm just going to riff on that a little bit. So your emotional center, it becomes really hypersensitive. Um, and um, can I use this word? You actually create your emotions. Like your emotions are being created in the moment. It's just happening with intensity. Um, where kids like will laugh at something louder than you would expect. Also louder than they would expect. Mm. Their mouth opens and something comes out that they're surprised by. Um, other things also fly through the room quite often because there's just more of everything. But when, the, when this is happening, it's often connected to an emotional feeling that kids don't know what it is. But more is happening more intensely because everything's reorganizing and those hormones are pushing, 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 pushing. Um, so here's what is helpful. Have anybody have a dramatic class this year or a dramatic kid in their class? <laughs> this is, this is your emotional center, everybody. This is this piece. The great news is by Supporting kids to use that positively, kids with more emotional responses have incredible potential for empathy. It's about helping shape that energy because you also know how sensitive that crowd of kids could be, right? Shut them down and they become your least favorite person. Say, wow, you have the feels and look what you did with the feels. All you have to do is honor kids and help them see when they used it well and they'll use it more well. But notice and tell them what they did not well and what happens. They, get, they do it more because they just get stuck in that rut. So we have to be careful what we bring kids' attention to and highlight the successful moments. And the less successful ones will move away because they'll get replaced by the success. Um, here we go. Here's, um, uh, I don't know how to say this kindly. We're entertainers in the middle years, aren't we? Somewhat. Kids in the middle years like novelty. They crave something different. Um, they also like excitement. I'm not saying be exciting every hour of the day or you'll need a nap. Some of you probably do every day, right? You're like, wow, I have nothing left. Um, like for instance, I sometimes used to take off my shoes at the end of teaching my middle years day and I couldn't find my shoes after because you just lose your energy. So you have to kind of say, where's that exciting peak experience in the day? And then have other things in your day that are supportive where kids are practicing and applying, but they do need something every day, which is kind of like, this is a focal point, but constant thrill doesn't equal constant learning. 
So you have to kind of find that balance. Um, another little piece is, I mentioned this earlier, their sensitivity to opinions increases because of their emotional center development. And so you take things on or you feel the critique. Sometimes even just raising your eyebrow results in like conflict. And so helping kids manage their emotions is important. Um, it's tricky because kids get into, have you seen your friendship groups change in your classroom almost daily? It's part of that sensitivity. And so building ways to work together is really important. Um, also, because kids are individuating away from their families somewhat or their normal groups, um, adults, like I said earlier, become really important in terms of being, uh, the literature calls us being anchors or anchor points or touch points for kids, which does not be, mean be their best friend. It means being there, letting them know that they're doing okay and helping them solve problems. With me so far? Um, tricky, that emotional wildness, intensity, development keeps going as long as your body is changing. So many of our kids will finish growing in grade eight and things will suddenly settle. Many of our kids will keep growing till grade 12, won't they? And so we just need to be aware and sensitive to all that feeling that's going on. Um, the kids who wake up in the morning and they're like an inch taller and they come in distraught about it or thrilled, I'm going to be in the MBA. We need to say, oh, thanks for that. And now let's move on. They need a little help managing that emotion. Oh. So that good old limbic system, um, it really picks up whatever is in the environment, something positive, something negative. Um, and so you'll notice kids in the middle years often will freeze, right? They just can't even reply because they're just trying to manage their emotion or they will push back in ways that aren't super helpful. And so part of what we need to do is just remember that a reaction or a feeling that you have as an adult is not what's happening for them. And be really careful not to map on what you think is going on onto a young adolescent because they're just feeling something intensely and maybe misinterpreting some feedback. Um, I, you may have noticed my um, use of gestures and facial expressions. I've had to learn with my middle years learners that they will misinterpret what I'm doing, yet they love it. They love everything I'm doing until they hate it. And they think it's a personal affront. And so I have to be okay with saying, oh, here's what I meant, or what did you think I did, instead of getting into like a, a power struggle with them around, you said that to me. I'm like, oh, I probably, when I raised my voice, it felt like that. So being able to detach the student's experience from your own experience. Um, can we just talk a little bit about dopamine? There is a constant seeking of pleasure or feeling happy. And that's because of the dopamine in your system. And so helping kids manage that. Remember I talked about having some kind of anchor thing during the day that's an exciting thing, but not trying to make everything that happens in your day. I would also recommend, if you could, teaching fewer things in the day or integrating things so that you kind of get a, a longer thing that builds to something versus otherwise kids are looking for every 40 minutes to have a peak. And it's really hard to learn deeply if you're always just looking for the high. Or in my case, the kids are looking for the joke. When's the joke coming? When's the joke coming? And so I have to dial it back a little bit. Um, the last one I just wanted to um, note is that it's really that first half, that age 12 to 16, um, where kids are desperately looking for that. And so helping them to feel okay and feel positive and giving them some language to be like, I did this well in my next, that little reflective piece, if you can build that in now, they'll be more successful. But you see a lot of kids in like kind of 15, 16, 17, 18, who just kind of tapped out. Have you met them? Right? And so part of us is helping them channel the way to be successful. Say, what did I do well? Great. <laughs> Doesn't that sound really fancy? <laughs> Inefficient prefrontal cortex. <clears throat> this is the, uh, so you got limbic system and you got um, prefrontal cortex, which is the other area where things are going on. Um, kids at this age can problem solve and can hypothesize, but they can't control what's firing. So what happens is you give them something to work on or, or a problem to try to solve and everything fires, including six things that don't have anything to do with it. 
And so um, one of the things that we can do are, that's really helpful is having kids turn to a partner and say, what's this task asking you to do? So task interpretation can be one of your best things. It requires no prep. Don't you love something that requires no prep? But has high yield, which is like, oh, we're supposed to do this. That helps kids. And also, it's better to do it with a partner than large group, because they get a practice, then they share out, then we clarify. Four minutes of clarification for high, high, high success in terms of being, does that, uh, that was a nice one? Um, Deb Butler and I had, did a little study a few years ago. 100 kids who were um, um, not having success in school, of those 100 kids, depending on how you analyzed it, between 82 and 88 of those 100 kids misinterpreted what they were supposed to do and end up doing the wrong thing or being off track. It's because you're like, let me get going. But the direction you go, your intuition isn't always on. And so you want to give them a chance to have real problems, but they need a chance to say, what am I supposed to do? Or what's the criteria? Or even better, let's build some criteria together. With me so far? Let's hang out here a little bit, people in the house. Um, <sighs> exerting self-control or problem solving actually takes a lot of energy, which is another reason why you can't make everything like this. If you do something really cool with a problem of the day where they're on vertical surfaces and they're coming up with their proofs and then they're explaining to each other and they're taking ideas from each other, probably the next thing they do should not kind of have that demand. Not because they can't do it, but because they've exerted so much energy. And so we need to kind of find a bit of a rhythm with our group. And I can't tell you the number of classrooms around BC in middle years which have moved to lamps or um, twinkle lights, or just a nice slow start for 20 minutes where kids are doing independent reading, um, or working with games, or, or working in a station. Because if you use it all up in the morning, what happens in the afternoon, middle years, colleagues? Um, so a myriad of things that cannot feel great. And so it's kind of saying, where's that peak of that day to have that? And then also having chances, because they can critically think, but it takes more of your energy. Um, I guess I already mentioned the um, dramatic behavior. But you've got all those feels. Um, but the other thing that kind of happens is there's just so much happening while they're doing things. It's more easy for a middle years learner to get distracted because they're more sensitive to everything. Light noise, something funny happening in the next classroom that they just all feel compelled to get up and go to the next classroom to see. And so you need to build some routines. I'm going to give you a couple examples, which is how can we work together well so that you're building a community that helps kids co-regulate. Ooh, that didn't come out quite right. That helps kids co-regulate their learning together. So colleagues in the house, oh, I've got one more plasticity one. Um, experience does help kids develop the brain. So in a way, um, I used to say we as teachers are, um, we're like house designers. In a way, we're brain developers. We are creating the conditions and the patterns for success and successful learning. Um, we won't really have this experience again in the same way, which is why we deserve not danger pay, but brain development pay. <laughs> Work that into negotiations. OK. Um, I also want to highlight, and Vicky's got a beautiful example coming up, and we'll look at examples each time we're together around creating kind of integrative units, which allow kids to work towards something to get a payoff, but where we can scaffold their thinking as we go. Um, so there we go. We're going to look at a couple. I got one that's coming up in this section too, a, a smaller one around a challenging experience that's helpful. Um, helping structure things. Kids in the middle years do need some structure. Have you noticed? Anyone? And so it's kind of like, here's the routines that we have. Here's how we work together. They just need a chance to be able to say, how am I doing and what could I adjust? Um, yeah, and then this is a different font, apparently. Model <laughs> um, modeling and creating inclusive environments is not something just for September. So I've got a cool little activity you could do next week around re-engaging or developing your community in your classroom to have some of those structures where kids co-own them. Um, but also, can I just remind us that kids are misinterpreting things all the time because so much is firing in their brains. And just because they understood you last week doesn't mean with all that's going on, they're, not, they're misinterpreting because so much more is firing. And so for us, I'd just like to say it's okay to take a breath 
there's a reason why we have to repeat ourselves several times. And anytime there's something to refer to to help clarify, we're going to look at class charters right now, or criteria, or an anchor chart, or an, in the writing folder, three or four steps. Any time you get a chance to refer them and say, well, what, look, look at that, then it makes you not about you and that student interaction. So we do need to move a little bit away from everything we say is done verbally to be able to refer back to something, which is why I love to have a learning tension for, intention for the week. So I'm like, what are we working on? They're like, I don't know. I'm like, is it on the board? They're like, yes, what is it? It's learning. Like, they go from, I know nothing, to, I get it. But there's something about giving kids the structure to refer to that helps them feel in control and moves you away from the power struggle. Your job is not to become a third parent or fourth parent or second parent that they're battling with, because that's kind of what you want to do, just have an emotional reaction. So here are some things that one could, we're not doing them all today, good luck, people. Um, but these are some things in the literature that primarily come from the social emotional learning literature that help kids build their competency, both to feel control, to learn routines, to manage their emotion, and to direct their own learning. I'm going to talk with you right now around emotional um, liter literacy charters. Um, participation structures are those kinds of things that come from, what's that book called about visibility? Making Thinking Visible, do you know that? In that book there are like 20 strategies. Those kinds of strategies that you use, maybe I'll sneak one in next time. But use that strategy and then keep using it in all your different subject areas so that kids become experts at the strategy. Um, I come from the 80s, did you figure that out yet? Back in the 80s and the early 90s, some of us were strategy junkies. I'm going to do something different every day because middle years kids love it, but then they don't get better at everything. Pick a couple strategies or three strategies and use them throughout the unit, and then kids become experts at them. Um, the, the messages that we send, we're going to do a lot on thinking strategies and routines next time. Uh, we're going to talk about inquiry learning. Um, for, anyway, these are things that fit really nicely, but let's do emotional literacy charters. <laughs> I just realized I'm being filmed again, I forgot. Here we go. So um, this comes from the Yale Center of Emotional Intelligence, and I want to celebrate um, a PhD um, candidate that I get to work with and research with. Her name is Miriam Miller, and her work is in social emotional learning, and so she's the one who introduced this to me. Um, it's helping to foster an uh, emotional climate that's positive and productive. These are the three, three questions that they, they suggest using that you post to your, quest, to your class. Um, how, how, do we wanna, how do we wanna feel as a community of learners? What can we do to support these feelings? And how will we handle conflict or uncomfortable feelings? So what they talk about is posing the, I'm gonna show you a couple examples, posing these questions to the class, doing some group brainstorming, and creating a charter together to refer to and work with. With me so far? Really nice um, questions. It's enough to, the, it's almost like um, creating criteria together. Maybe you've done that before, but you're doing it really with this focus around how can we work together and be together. Did I mention this is a great activity for November, the dark month? Right? And so it helps you be able to create something positive. Plus, it's outside of the content you're learning, the content is the kids. And there's nothing more empowering to a young teenager than being heard and having their thinking show up on the board. So this is Dave Dunnigan's class. He is a teacher um, who may even be tuning in right now. Hi, Dave, um, in Coquitlam. And so with his grade six, seven students, he goes through this visioning process to create their community. Here's what he asks. He says, what makes a great classroom? How are the students learning? How is the teacher teaching? How does everyone treat each other and interact with each other? And what routines and expectations help our learning? Can I just highlight the last one? It helps kids say, oh, that's why we do that. Or we need more than that versus Mr. Schnell, you're always telling me to do this. They're like, this is helpful. It helps them own it and see it. And so that's why it's a good time to do it now. Because right about now, kids are burning out with the routines you put into place in September, aren't they? They're like, we don't want this anymore. But if they can say, this is why it's useful, then we're like, we need that thing. And here's the example from his class. Um, here's what they came up with. Um, we will be kind, like, do you like the we statements too? 
We will be kind, respectful, and try, not to, and try to include, not exclude. We will try to have fun while we are learning. We will celebrate our joys and successes. We will learn and show our learning in different ways. The class came up with, they should have a choice to show their learning. People, do you know who the best differentiators are? The kids. Can I show it this way? Can I do it that way? I don't know. Does it meet the criteria? Yeah. Well, then I think you better do it. No. Well, you better find a way to make it work. Um, here we go. Um, we can choose to eat healthy food when we want to. No one's working with middle years kids, clearly. Right? It's kind of like, it's about, they didn't come up with something that's not possible. So they're talking about working on it. Um, if problems arise, we will work together to solve them. See that, that, that piece around conflict resolution? And then we will make our classroom our own. Can I show you one more? OK, people are taking photos of it. <laughs> um, this is uh, Melissa Burdock's class. She's in Penticton, SD67. Or she might be in Summerland this year, but she's in um, the South Okanagan. These are the questions she asked the kids. What are your, your worries about school for the year? Um, what are you excited about? What supports do you need to have a successful year? How do you want to be treated when you are at school? And what does community mean to you? So you can see each of these teachers has slightly tweaked their questions. It's also nice to have a different version. You can use one version in November. And you can use one version in January. I highly recommend this in January. When you're all coming back together, let's rebuild our community. And then maybe use another version right after spring break. The best and longest two weeks in some kids' lives. Um, you can see maybe this was done in French. <laughs> so my apolo uh, Melissa's on the, on, on the webcast right now. Um, my apologies, Melissa, if my version of the translation, especially about the second question, I went, that's, I hope I got it right in English. Um, so here's what they did. They did this brainstorm. So they said, um, they started to talk about how they wanted to feel in their classroom. The students wrote, they did some journaling or brainstorming and said, how do I want to feel? And then in their writing, they went back and circled all the emotion words. <laughs> if you really want to help kids with all these emotions that they have, we need to like start to work with and acknowledge the emotions. Um, then they built a charter, but first they did it in small groups. So groups about your size, four or five or six, kids came up with coming up with their statements, we will, we want to, we will. And then they shared that full class. Um, what happened, um, for Melissa, she says this happened in previous years, there's a bit of debate about who gets to be on the chart. So then they had to talk a little bit about um, allowing everyone's voice to be heard. So you just kind of sneak that in. Um, and then they used the charter that they made they do a uh, once a week morning circle at the beginning and end of the week. And so they use the chart to refer to how are things going, how are you feeling. You know, the anybody do a check-in at some point during your week? They use that as their check-in. And did I, oh, they pick a word of the week from their charter to focus on. Most weeks, Melissa says. And here is their charter. <laughs> so the students also decided how they want to represent it together as a class. So this year's class decided to do it in this way, um, recognizing the cultural diversity that is in their class and also how they're there together. And these are the words translated into English. They want to feel respected, included, safe, equal, welcome, calm, accepted. When something's not going well, like particularly not well, somebody in the class, whether it's a teacher or a kid, can call a circle and they can come together and refer back to the charter, not to make someone feel bad, but to say, how can we get back to that feeling? But then you have that thing to refer to versus you need to go to the office, or I don't want to send you to the office, but I don't know what to do. A kid will be like, oh my goodness, Heather needs circle right now. We all need to support her. And the, see that how that's called community problem solving? That takes it away from that's a crappy behavior to how can we support our peer to have success? Um, I will say, though, it's great to call the circle, not for the kid who has the most significant behavior in the classroom, but it's great when somebody says, I need a circle right now, and they're a kid that you would never think is having emotional challenges, because then it makes it okay for us all to have feelings and for us all to support each other. One more example, and then, and then I'll let you talk. So uh, do you like that, the Emotional Literacy Charter? Great for November, January, late March. Heck, right after Easter, if that too much turkey happened. 
This is an example of um, integrative or challenging curriculum. This is using, um, you can call it Maker Day, you can call it ADST, you can call it design thinking, you call it empathetic design. Um, what happened, this is in Yellowknife, um, shout out to Willie Mac Middle. Um, but they had, you might remember this from the news a couple years, they had to shoot a wolverine on the school grounds because they couldn't capture it. And so the, prob so the problems they solved is, after they learned a bit about simple machines, they had to come up with a possible solution so that the next time there was a wolverine was lost, what could they do? Um, a part of the brainstorming, one of the girls in the class who's Dene said, my father's heart hurt when that wolverine was shot. So we got a chance to welcome indigenous knowledge. Plus, we had another kid in the class who's one of the kids of the wildlife officers, the two wildlife officers. So it's a real thing. Um, so here's these two boys coming up with their solution. This is camouflage, in case you're wondering, in their design. So they were luring in the wolverine. Um, these two young ladies created a really nice trap, right, using a simple machine. Um, it was so cool to see one of those students um, in the mix because I've actually, I've been working in the Arctic for about 15, 19 years now. I've seen that girl at five different schools over the years. How nice to, for her to be successful and have one of the most successful designs in the class. Um, you'll notice the exact same coloring of the popsicle sticks. Maybe because one of the boys in that group wants to date one of the girls in that group. Look at my model. Do you notice anything about it? Um, but one of the boys is the son of the wild, wildlife officer. So here is their design. They went through a process of designing. But see how they're making something to solve a problem using this. Everything doesn't have to be the peak, but you're building towards making a difference. And then my favorite two young men are these two young men who created two traps using two different simple machines and compared them. <laughs> um, they also brought that book for me to explain that since that happened, they've actually been reading about traps because they think this is a problem that needs to be solved and they were already thinking about it. <laughs> okay, friends, do a wee bit of little thinking. I taught, this was supposed to be about brain development, remember? Plasticity, emotions, the emotional center, the limbic system, dopamine, dopamine, so much of it. How do we think about helping kids have ways to channel and use those things, but also a little bit thinking about how do we not react when kids are giving us all of that, but understand what's going on for them, and then help have ways to use those emotions or solve problems in positive ways. Four minutes and nine seconds, talk to somebody, go. And there's a slide to go with it. <laughs> 